Hello, this is David Mandel once again, and welcome to week five of CIS 240L Linux configuration and installation in, given in the summer of 2012. For this week, uh, let's see, the first thing we should do is talk about Caligator, like normal, which I normally have up, but I don't at the moment, so let's get that up. And OK, here we are with Caligator. Let's look at what we've got this week, uh, going on this week. We have uh, today, there's a webinar. There is um, PDX Women in Information Technology Happy Hour. Oh, that sounds like fun. Um, and there's some sort of code thing here. Tomorrow, there's a personal telco meeting. Personal telco at personaltelco.net, as I recall, is a really cool group in the Portland area and very open source oriented. Actually, they were founded at Beer after a meeting of the Portland Linux Unix group a few years ago. So they're, they're, they're a cool group. Um, there's also Portland Java Script admirers. JavaScript used to be not very popular with open source people, but that has really changed with the advent of oh, something called AJAX as a technique of doing web pages and a lot of other things. JavaScript is now well accepted in the open source community. Um, Portland Games for Change. Um, OK, on Thursday, there's a uh, online startup summer camp. Um, uh, building the customer wow machine. Um, that's an urban spaceship, or, or urban airship. Urban airship is a pretty open source oriented organization. Um, PDX weekly hackathon, Ignite planning meeting, wearable computer hackathon. That ought to be cool. Um, for people making computers that you can wear. There's a lot of that being done now, both for computers that you can use for work type things and computers that can augment um, your abilities, especially for people with disabilities and things like that. OK, let's go back and look at um, other things. Um, quiz 3 is now open. and um, closes um, at the end of Sunday, so uh, please do quiz three. Um, lab seven, not many people have turned lab seven in, so I haven't graded lab seven yet, but I have graded labs one through six, except for a few late papers that were turned in that I haven't graded yet. Um, all the labs up to lab seven are graded. I will soon grade lab seven and then start charging a late penalty once I, uh, for anyone that turns it in after that. Um, oh, or is it lab seven? Well, we need to look at the schedule here to see just what we've got going on. We're on week um, five. We should be doing lab eight this week. Lab seven was last week. So yes, get lab seven in. And lab eight you're doing this week, which is yet another script. We've got three scripts to write this term, um, which says how important I think scripts are. OK. The um, next thing is um, just a little bit of a discussion of um, um, programming, because we are writing scripts, which is a simple programming language. I've got something in my hair. Oh, a fly. Um, I had a fly in my hair. OK, but we are writing scripts. And um, that is um, um, a, that's a simple programming language. Once again, scripting is really important for any Unix systems administrator. You don't have to be really good at writing complex scripts, but you need to be really good at writing very simple scripts because it's something that you want to do all the time as a systems administrator is to write simple scripts. Um, some people write really complicated scripts, but that's not really necessary. This chapter 
or this week, one of the things we'll be doing is doing chapter eight of the textbook. And chapter eight of our textbook here is on um, systems administration, uh, system initialization, and X windows. What you will find with the systems uh, initialization on any any Unix system, uh, not just Linux, when you boot them, or everyone I'm familiar with, when you boot them, what they do is they look into some directory someplace. On Linux, it tends to be slash etc slash init.d. And down in that directory, it will find messes and messes of scripts. Those and then it starts to execute those scripts. Those are born shell scripts or bash shell scripts. Um, born and bash shell being almost identical. Um, and it will start to execute those scripts. And those scripts basically tell the system how to come up and what to do as it comes up. Uh, so another reason you want to be aware of uh, born shell or bash shell scripting is in order to read these scripts and possibly even modify a few of these scripts if you need to. Um, because that is where you make changes in what happens as a system comes up. Now, the truth is you rarely have to make many changes. The book also talks a lot about the system using S files and K files and various things for starting up services and shutting down services as the system comes up and as the system goes down. If you look at my videos, I will I discuss this, but I also discuss a much simpler way of doing this and that the book does not discuss. And although I would use the books method if I was writing a complex new service, and I have used that method. And I'd highly recommend it if I was writing a big complex new service. For the routine day-to-day -day systems administration, the system I use I think works a lot better. I simply modify a script in the section of script startups called um, boot.local, or sometimes in it, um, there's a script called in it, um, or in it tab, in it tab, I guess, that I have to modify. And those are probably the only two scripts that you will ever have to modify, and that's fairly rare. And that saves you from having to go through and do all this stuff that the book uh, displays. Um, not to say that the book method is wrong, because indeed, if I was writing a major um, um, a major new service, that's exactly the system I would use. But for routine, for my own routine systems or for my employer system, I'd be more likely to shortcut that method than than do the full method. The book also talks a lot about um, about um, talks a bit about X Windows, and I will probably talk a little bit about X Windows in class. And the videos talk quite a bit about X Windows because because um, X Windows is really cool. Um, finally, I'd like to say a word uh, before we end on programming and programming languages. Um, in the old days, most of us programmed in languages like C, Fortran, or COBOL. Scientific programmers generally programmed in C and Fortran. There's still some of that work done. Uh, those still remain important languages. Fortran people don't think are important, but if you happen to be in the area of massively parallel computers, like people in atmospheric sciences, um, um, molecular genetics, um, areas like that where that are highly computational, they still use a lot of Fortran. C continues to be important for scientific programming. And C is also really an important systems language. 
all of your device drivers or most of your device drivers your and and the system whether it's windows or whether it's linux they tend to be written in the c programming language Java I know less about, not being a Java programmer. I do know there's a lot of jobs in the Java field. But, but the languages I'd like to talk a little bit about, because I think they're more practical for getting jobs in, although my own work's been mostly in C and Fortran. But the languages that I think are where the jobs today are in are PHP, Perl, Python, Ruby, TCL. I, languages like that. They're the fast scripting languages. These used to not really be very mm, powerful languages, and, and real programmers didn't program in these. But this has entirely changed, because these languages have been implemented differently now, where they are pretty fast. Well, I'd say very fast. Um, not as fast as C or Fortran in executing code, but still very fast and very flexible. They're excellent languages. And they're used as like the back end, the, the, the programming stuff that we write all the glue that glues databases to, to what's happening on web pages. And um, that's where the work is today, is, is on that type of thing. A lot of financial systems, a lot of, um, um, there's a lot of work there. At OSCON last week, which I went to, I talked to a recruiter who basically told me she could find work for anyone that uh, had about a year's training or whatnot in Ruby. Well, she was a little bit spaced out because nobody teaches a year of Ruby. But it does mean if you could get one term of, of a, a Python or Ruby and then get um, some experience using it, um, either by volunteering for an open source project or by um, taking other classes that use that language, um, you'd be in good shape for getting a job, I think. If you want to be a programmer, that's the last thing. Programming takes a special type of personality. Um, I enjoy programming, but I don't like to program my whole life. Um, it's uh, You spend hours and hours and hours sitting at a computer screen. And um, my, my own feeling, I love to program because I'm kind of a mathematician. But you know, program for two weeks or a month. Eat and breathe programming, eat pizza and beer, and sit in front of a computer screen programming, and then get away from it for a month. And unfortunately, a lot of programming jobs, you don't get that opportunity to get away from it. And that I find to be a little bit, um, well, to each his own. Some people like that. Personally, I do need to get away from it. Uh, um, on the other hand, I have done a lot of programming over the years and been quite successful at it. And, uh, and I do truly enjoy it. It does take a personality that likes to, um, oh, likes to be very precise and, and, and doesn't mind very being uh, dealing with a lot of tedious stuff. Um, um, if you love mathematics, you'll probably like programming. That's what it amounts to. If you hate mathematics, I really wouldn't recommend that you become a programmer, uh, even, even doing non-mathematical work. Um, however, there are job opportunities there. And um, with that, I will, I will end the video. Thank you. Bye-bye.